Oh, hello. Hola, hola. Hola a todos, amigas, amigos. Welcome to Lima once again. Welcome to my home. Welcome to my beautiful city and to this new virtual adventure and historic talk about one of the untold chapters of the history of Peru, probably one of the less defound, uh, although very interesting, of course. We're going to talk about the human sacrifice in pre-Hispanic times. What is the importance uh, of the findings that archaeologists have been able to reach out, connected with the human sacrifices uh, from the pre-Hispanic times? And which ones were the cultures that sacrificed humans uh, in the ancient days? So today's talk is inspired in many documentaries and books. I will be also letting you know some of the books I have used and consulted for today's event. And maybe you can also uh, find these books online or uh, physical uh, wherever you live, because these are books in English also. And the documentaries at the end of this event, I will uh, give you a list of these documentaries. Or if you wish, also let me know it through a message and I can send you the link so you can open those documentaries uh, at home. Uh, so thanks a lot for visiting me today. Once again, hola, hola. Let me say hi now to the to my friends joining, to all the people joining. Hola, Susie. Thanks for coming, amiga. Hola, Matthew and Michael. Thanks for joining. Hola, Nicolas. ¿Cómo estás, amigo? Cari. Hola, hola. Marilyn. Hello. Thanks for coming. Corinne, Adrian, John, Ellen, hola, thanks for visiting, Ellen. I miss you. Mark, Ellen, Adrian, amiga, ¿qué tal? Natasha, Susan, hola. Cari, Cari, linda. Eva, ¿cómo estás, Eva? Ciara, Spirit, hola, Terry. Thanks for visiting, Terry. So, thanks a lot for coming today and also for your interest in Peruvian culture, history, and especially the, the untold history, the history that is not really well, uh, you know, like, I think a spotlight. Um, also because I, I, I know you know, Peru is such a distant land, uh, such a exotic land you know, for, for most of the people around the world, and a way uh, that people had to, to have to learn about Peru is traveling to Peru. It's coming in person. But, you know, not always we can travel in person. So that's one of the things I love about virtual traveling, that you can learn about the history of many beautiful places around the world and without the needs of, you know, paying a ticket and going in person. Uh, I also hope you can come in person to Peru uh, in the future. And if you do that, please, please, not just travel to the beautiful Cusco or Lima or Arequipa or Puno. When you do that, use the service of an official tour guide. In Peru, we have wonderful guides. We are all licensed tour guides. Uh, to be a tour guide, you need to have a license in Peru. And I know that happens also in many other cities around the world. We take tourism very serious in Peru. That's why I am an official tour guide. I studied to become a tour guide during three years. Uh, and during those years, I learned most of the history I'm telling you today. So um, I really hope you enjoyed today's event. I think the group is ready to begin. Um, so we're going to talk about human sacrifices in pre-Hispanic times. And this is a lecture from my home. If you have a question, please use the chat uh, here, there is a beautiful chat section uh, made especially for us to communicate, for me to hear, read your que the questions. Uh, if you see the chat very active, um, that's really okay, no problem. Uh, I will ask you please to put a cue in the beginning of your question. So in that way, I can identify if it's a question for me, well, because sometimes well, we have interaction in the chat and, and I don't want you to be limited to, to not comment. Um, so if you have a question for me, please try to use a cue in the beginning. Okay, so well, I think we're going now to begin. I will turn, uh, flip the camera, but also before that, as I promised, 
I would like to give you two recommendations in terms of books that will be also interesting for you if you want to uh, keep reading um, at home about this topic. Uh, this one here, Violence, Ritual, and, Wadi, and the Wadi Empire. It's really interesting. It also talks about the human sacrifices in pre-Hispanic times during the Wadi Empire. And we have this one here, which is wonderful. I have used it especially to, for this event, Ritual Sacrifice in Ancient Peru. Okay. Um, if you need more information about these books, just let me know later um, at, the, at the end of this event so I can give you the names of the authors and more. Okay, so now we're going to turn the camera up. First of all, turn off the light. Okay, so now we're going to the hot topic. And uh, today we're going to talk about human sacrifice, but also we're going to understand that there were different types of human sacrifices in pre-Hispanic Peru. It was not just one type of sacrifice and also not just one single culture doing human sacrifices. Um, so we're going to try to go in a certain chronological order. I have for the you know, purpose of, of keeping this event like short, still like in the, in the frame of 45 minutes, I have picked um, three societies, three cultures uh, to, to discuss about them uh, um, and also their connections with the human sacrifices. But also, um, I think we are going to have at some point to come back to this theme of the human sacrifices because there are many ancient societies in Peru that used to do that. So before we go straight to the uh, to the, you know, describing about the, the ways how the human sacrifices were done, in which time frame also they were done, since when, until when. It is important to remember that nowadays when we think about human sacrifices, you know, we think in something macabre, no? We think in something like terrible, uh, like how come someone would be able to do that? Well, you know, human sacrifice is as old as humanity, yeah? Uh, even in the Bible, you know, there are uh, passages in which human sacrifices are, are mentioned, right? So we as humanity have evolved in society also, understanding the human sacrifices were a way to please deities, to please God or gods, the gods, right? Why? Because we believe that humans are the, the you know, the ultimate, you know, the, the most important creation, because we are all creations in all of the societies around the world. We have been created by the gods or God. So uh, meaning that because we are the creations of God, you know, and, and if we want to please God, you know, the, the best thing you can give to God is, you know, a human, a creation and not just a, a common human, a one that is selected, a person that is selected, could be for many reasons, because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it really depends on, on the culture and the society. So starting with this, you know, I don't want you to judge the human sacrifices in a modern way. Please, we have to be like archaeologists. We have to be like the historians. We have to be like anthropologists. We have to study this, right, and understand and put in the shoes of the people of that time. So now I would like to take you back in time uh, to one of the oldest societies that existed in Peru. And that society also very well studied, especially uh, uh, since the beginnings of the 20th century. Actually, there was lots of investigation going on around this culture. It is called Mochica, the Mochica culture, right? Also known as Moche. Both names are correct. Uh, this was a society that existed in the north coast of Peru uh, between the beginnings of Christian era, about 2,000 years ago, until the year 700 of our era. The disappearance of many of the societies of Peru, especially the ones of the coast of Peru, is usually connected with natural disasters. Who can tell me which natural disaster can cause the destruction of an ancient society in this part of Peru. Anyone has any idea? If you have any idea, please comment here. Uh, okay, Cari, excellent, a volcano. Okay, this is a very valid answer indeed. Any other person would like to guess what type of, uh, let's say, event 
Oh, earthquake, excellent, Cari. Muy bien. Ex earthquakes can be destructive and, and the tsunamis happening after them, of course. Flood or drought. Muy bien, Andrew. Michael and Andrew, you are also in a good direction, right? Of course. So just to imagine, you know, the times when these people used to exist uh, in the coast of Peru, we have to understand that the coast of Peru was and it still is a desert coast. So we are in the desert. We are in an earthquake zone, right? We are in a seismic location. In, in planet Earth, there are many zones that are very active, right? We have volcanoes, especially in the south of, of Peru, oh, Arequipa, oh, where my friend Elizabeth lives. Uh, uh, Elizabeth is our guy in Arequipa. Uh, there are volcanoes there. Right. But there is one event that we know for sure could be so catastrophic because all of the said below before, you know, uh, they are quite common in Peru. Oh, we have earthquakes, we have floods, drowns, you know, volcanoes also have ex exploded. But the Nino phenomenon, remember, the Nino phenomenon has been uh, by excellency the worst of all the societies. So just to give you an idea of our location, uh, the place where we are, uh, you know, like referring to in, in the country is in the north of the country, the north coast of Peru, a zone nowadays known as Trujillo. Uh, it's a beautiful zone uh, within the Department of La Libertad. And it is about 550 kilometers away from Lima. So I live in Lima. My city is the capital of Peru. So that zone is in the north. Look at the many valleys, the many valleys, right? The valleys are the, the, the reason of the existence of the ancient societies of Peru. So look how important the connection between the ancient people, you know, uh, the water, the sweet water from the Andes, you know, the climatic conditions to be stable, right? Uh, to be able you know, to use, they didn't need any, any rain. It's not needed, the rain in, in the desert. You need just water to come from the mountains. Uh, so the source of the rain is far, far away from you, but the water comes, you know, through these seasonal rivers. And then you have water enough to, uh, to use it in the agriculture, to use it to drink, right? But what happens when we have a Nino phenomenon? So the Nino phenomenon is the worst thing that can happen to a society that exists in the desert where we are used to the climatic conditions of the desert, you know, when we don't have rains, you know, and then the Nino comes. Nino, the Nino phenomenon is the warming up of the temperature of the water. The Pacific here is cold, uh, it's cold water. So when we have warm water coming into the Peruvian territory, into the coast, we have abnormal rains in the coasts. So rains where we should not have rains. And what causes this? Well, these people were people of the desert, so they were not prepared for rains. You know, and, and sometimes we have, you know, short periods of rains. That's, you know, unusual, but it can happen. But we are talking here about mega Nino phenomena, Ninos that lasted for years and that were not stopping. So these people believe because they are creations, you know, they are creations, they are uh, creators, or they were created by gods, that the gods, because there are many people dying due to the, you know, diseases, the lack of water, the sweet water to drink, because everything is, you know, like, muddy, you know, the rivers are muddy, uh, there's no place to plant. They believe that the gods are killing many people because they are thirsty of humans, uh, human lives, right? Not just animal lives, human lives. So this piece you see here uh, is a, a little segment of a pottery, which is in a museum, is in Larco Museum, is a really beautiful, gore-like um, pottery, beautiful round that has this scene. So we're going to begin this this first, you know, like uh, explanation in terms of pre-Hispanic sacrifice with this piece. Uh, at some point, we're going to return to this one, I think. But I think we we have a time, good time, to um, 
see a video, okay? And it is important for us to understand that the archaeologists are the ones who have helped us uh, to understand the history of Peru through the investigation of potteries, okay? From the observation and the comparison of potteries because the pre-Hispanic societies didn't have any written system or so far we believe there was no written system, but this is also another untold history that I will be telling you. So, of course, conventional, conventional uh, written system they didn't have, but they use these symbols in the vessels uh, to, to store information, uh, to, to keep information, to transmit information. So, for example, these vessels, this is an animation used um, using uh, drawings from potteries that were buried in religious and ritualistic locations. Uh, we can see these groups of warriors. So imagine we are in the moment of the Nino phenomenon. We are in the time of the Mochica people, the Mochica culture, this very elevated, very sophisticated society that created pyramids, aqueducts, all oh, that were completely adapted to the desert. But now the gods have turned their backs to them. So they believe that the gods probably wanted human bloods. They wanted, uh, a, let's say, fights. Blood was connected with fertility. Why? Well, it was believed, and this is something now we know thanks to the, um, let's say, the investigation that anthropologists have done to indigenous groups that still exist in Peru, uh, is believed that blood as water in Pachamama, in the world, water animates, uh, you know, the existence of all of us. You know, the same happens with the blood, right? So the blood, and you can see here, you know, the importance of spilling the blood of the, uh, the captives, because these are ritual fights, right? Uh, so the blood had to be spread, you know, in the in the fighting zones, in the in the you know in the zones that were pointing out to be the the places of confrontation, but people were not killed immediately in those battlefields because we are talking about more ritualistic battlefields. The death of the prisoners happened in a different location. It had to be done in a temple, right? And it had to be done in the presence of people. By the way, these creatures you see there are black vultures, animated like a little cartoons, right? Uh, also with some human, you know, parts like arms and legs. They are black vultures, which are also connected with the dead because the vultures, they go around the, the dead bodies, right? Or dead animals, you know, uh, they are scavengers. So you can see that the people who were chosen to die, there were many different um, sort of like speculations about who died in those ritual ceremonies that were portrayed in these vessels, right? Um, if they were like people of the elite or maybe they were people from all the towns, you can see also you know, the dismembering of these people um, or the chopping of the, you know, the, the necks to recollect the blood. From the investigation in DNA of the people who later were discovered, you know, the, the bodies of the people who were later discovered, that we know they were uh, people sacrificed. We know that they were not from the locations where the the temple was right so they came from distant locations they were from all the communities right and here we can see all oh, this representation of these deities which were actually leaders who are dressed up like the gods uh, which have now recopulated the blood uh, you can see also this uh, um, sort of like a bird uh, priest given 
a cup with blood, the sacrificial blood, is speculated if the blood was all intaken or spilled, spilled over the floor, right? So this is just to give you an idea of the how the, um, sorry, how these vessels, the pre-Hispanic vessels, uh, are of help for us to understand the actual ceremonies of the past, right? Of course, that we cannot take those vessels like um, sort of like uh, like the last word or, or so like seriously in some moments because some of them are more representations of, for example, the afterlife. But we know for sure that they are connected with the ways how these indigenous people of Peru, these ancient cultures used to see their world, right? So not taking them literal, but in some cases we know that they were portraying, you know, actual events. And when the first group of archaeologists or sort of like a semi-professional archaeologists uh, that started to investigate archaeological sites in the north coast of Peru in the beginnings of the 20th century, um, they were trying to do the most professional job they could, but of course, Carbon 14 was not there, you know. So they started to find potteries with these ceremonies, right? With this dismembering of people. Uh, but not a, a place where the bodies was discovered yet until the 1990s, right? So the site you can see here in this picture uh, is a place that is located in the north coast of Peru. This is the Huaca de la Luna. Huaca de la Luna. Huaca means archaeological site um, in Quechua. Quechua is the language of the Incas. Uh, it was the Frank language in the pre-Hispanic times when the Spaniards came. That was the language we use as a Frank language. But before the Incas, there were many other languages in Peru spoken, right? Uh, it's like English now. Uh, uh, most of us speak English as a Frank language, but there are other languages, right, that exist around the world. And also are, there are languages that were extincted some time ago, right? So that's the case with the language of these people, which we don't know which language they spoke. But we call the archaeological sites of these people huacas. So this is the Huaca de la Luna because it's an archaeological site uh, that archaeologists believed was dedicated to the moon. Luna is moon, right? Um, so this is a reconstruction of how is believed the Huaca de la Luna looked like when it was in use. Uh, so you can see, first of all, that the temple which is right next to, to a mountain, a hill, uh, is made in adobe because, remember, we don't have rain in the coast of Peru. It rains almost nothing in the coast of Peru. Um, and it used to be also painted. It had a, a beautiful, beautiful, you know, like series of um, walls, like frescoes, multicolor, very, very beautiful uh, that of course, partially are gone. But thanks to the archaeological investigation, and by the way, the, the discovery of this place happened in the 1980s, no? and the investigation of this site started in the 1980s. So it's very important to know that it has been years and years of investigation. So uh, in this Huaca de la Luna, many uh, tombs were discovered that were fundamental to understand that the potteries that we saw before, right? I'll try to go backwards here to, to just give you an idea of, of what. Oh, here, great. So the potteries that were discovered uh, connected with the Mochica or Moche people were not just creation of the mind uh, of these people or, you know, like myths and legends. Uh, in fact, these were representations of actual events that happened. For example, we have here, you know, these four participants. This one, for example, is a female. These participants of the ceremony, where their tombs were discovered. 
the actual people that are here represented were discovered in tombs in that archaeological site, right? And also in some other sites in the nearby location. How we know that? Well, that is because the a series of decorations, the type of headdresses, the elements that you see associated with these people were in fact in the tombs. So this was the first part, you know, like discovery of the tombs of these people that indicated to the archaeologists that this is not a mythical image. This is something real. But look what's below. We have two people tied, naked, and they are bleeding. They are bleeding. And this, these priests that are on the sides, they are holding in place the blood that is coming down. Right? So what an interesting thing. I have a question here that I saw from Audrey. Audrey, thanks for your question. Do we know if the little black and white creature is a cat or a dog? Um, oh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, which one, Audrey? Maybe I miss it. Um, oh, this one here. Yeah, this is a doggy. This is a doggy. Thank you, Audrey, for, for pointing this out. This is a dog. This one here. And we have also in Peru many different, we used to have many different breeds of dogs. Unfortunately, when the conquistadors came, many of these dogs, the breeds that were endemic, were either killed by the Spanish dogs that were braver because they were bigger dogs or later were mixed. We have um, existing nowadays two breeds of dogs that are pure, the dog of Chiribaya and the Peruvian hairless dog. I think I will be making an event about those two endemic species of dogs in Peru. I don't know if you would like to learn about them. <laughs> okay, Audrey, I'll do it. I'll do it. Muy bien, Cari. So, <laughs> yes, they are very, very unique dogs. Uh, very unique dogs. So, here we have the front section uh, of this um, sort of like a, this, this facade of the temple of the moon. And, and look how pretty, how big. Also, we, we would be like smaller than this representation of humans that you can see here, we will be smaller. So imagine how massive the temple is. And also there were zones which were completely private, well, where the ceremonies, the private ceremonies happened. But here we probably had public ceremonies. So what we can see here in this bottom part is naked uh, warriors, men who are ready to be taken, to be killed, right? So... Now we're going to continue with the investigations that happened in the 1990s. In the 1990s, in a segment of the back of the temple, in the sections called Plaza 3A and 3C, uh, a group of archaeologists was able to discover what for a long time they were aiming to. They wanted to find actual evidence of human sacrifice. Evidence that gives us an idea of if these images portrayed, you know, like a represented of, you know, people who were dismembered and, and you know, like a kill, you know, like in, in rituals were real, right? So indeed, the archaeologists discovered that this more private section was used as a burial zone, but not really, to be honest, they were not really buried properly because the ancient Peruvians had beautiful burial traditions, like they were very complex. But if you see this here, it's like seeing the, a crime scene, you know? We see people that are, for example, this individual is tied in the, in the back, in their, you know, the, the breasts are tied in the back and he's looking completely to the floor. We have people we have uh, with missing limbs. We have people with, you know, completely dismembered. It is believed that some of the dismembering happened post-mortem, of course. But we know that there is a killing pattern, uh, which is cutting the uh, neck uh, and also the chest, right? Why? Well, um, first of all, remember that the importance was to recopulate blood, blood and the heads, heads and blood 
are very important. Blood is connected with this liquid element that animates the body, animates us. And because we are a creation of, hum of the gods, humans are a creation of the gods, and also our world is creation of the gods. What animates our, wo our world? The water. Oh, because without the water, animals cannot exist. We humans cannot exist. So the belief is that the world, the blood of the world is the water. Uh, um, and well, we have our own blood, right? Which was used as a way to please the thirsts of the gods. Oh, the gods were thirsty of blood in some occasions. Uh, so that's why this uh, blood was a spill for the gods to feel uh, satisfied. Uh, also, in a little while, I'll tell you something about a ceremony that is still exists in Peru where people uh, still spill blood for the gods. Nowadays, 2023, it is still happens. Huh? Um, but before, I want to just show you that there are evidences also of these final moments in which the people are tied you know, like they are not able to defend themselves and they are ultimated, they are killed with the um, this sort of like uh, clubs, you know, they used to be part of clubs that uh, we know on the skull, there's evidence of the use of them. Can you see the incisions here? These incisions, again, another incision here. So they were probably produced by this type of clubs. Uh, Ellen, you have a question, my dear. How did they relate to menstrual? Well, interesting, Ellen. I haven't found yet any investigation about the team. And this is also one of the future teams I want to take in consideration for us about menstruation in the pre-Hispanic times, right? Um, but there's really, it's a field that is almost not investigated in its full yet. Mm -hmm. So... Again, we can see also a skull, but what is this skull showing? If we see in detail uh, the section over here, we can see cuts. Can you see the cuts? Ellen, very interesting commentary. Um, I think you are pointing me in the right direction. I will also do my investigation related to, to what you are saying. Thank you, Ellen. Muchas gracias. So here we have, I hope you can see it, evidences of cuts. So uh, what, I, what is the belief of these people, oh, of, of the archaeology, sorry, about these, these people? No, It is believed, thanks to these evidences, that at some point the face, the skin of the face was removed, right? They are evidences of subtype of Remotion of the skin in the faces. And what is surprising is that there are vessels, pre-Hispanic vessels, with the representation of a skeletons tied naked, like the, you know, looking similar to the uh, warriors, right? That I was saying, you know, this is a, uh, the, the conclusion of a sacrificial, first of all, warfare, right? So they are completely skeletons. And probably this is a representation of the faces completely removed from the skin, right? Uh, Louis, thanks for your question. Was cannibalism also practiced in ancient Peru in conjunction with human sacrifice? Louis, uh, in the uh, documentaries, I was able to see, and also at the end, if you want me, I can send you the links also. Well, you can see the links also at the end. Uh, the archaeologists mentioned that there has not been any conclusive information about cannibalism, right? So nothing is completely conclusive. There are archaeologists that are inclined that yes, some say no. Um, but for example, the drinking of human blood, which is not conclusive as well, because we don't have a, a vessel in which we see the priest uh, touching with the mouth, the cup, you know, with the with the blood, we know they have the 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 cup. We know they have blood in it, but it is just being presented. And then what happened next? We don't know. We don't know if they drank the blood or they sp spilled the blood in the floor as part of the ceremony. 
right? So there are things that unfortunately we are yet limited to know. But thanks a lot, Louis, for the question, by the way. Muchas gracias. And thanks for the follows, Trisha. Thanks for, for the follows, amigos. Uh, I am bringing always new events like, like this one related with history and archaeology, which is a theme I love very much. So thank you, Louis. Look at this. Can you see the cuts? Can you see the cuts? Look at that. You need a very sharp knife to be able to penetrate into the spine. Actually, these are necks from, uh, neck bone. Oh, this is the neck bone, right? So these are very deep cuts. And it's not just one clean cut. It's several, many, one after the other, after the other, after the other. So we are seeing really tremendous you know, like spilling of, of blood uh, in, in these events or uh, in these ceremonies, right? Um, why? Why? Why it was necessary? You know, with the first one, the person is dead. But remember, we are talking about a ceremony that has had to be like a big show, right? Sayuri, amiga, hola, hola, hola. Thanks for coming, amiga. So this is an, an evidence uh, of how you know bloody these ceremonies were um, another evidence and look at this for example you know we have the nose of this person with you know tremendous evidences of being like repeatedly be hit uh, by a very strong it could be a, a, a sort of like a hammer or a club and these are Mm, also the representations from potteries. Remember that potteries are great help for us to understand the past, not to be taken literal, but they help a lot of blood coming, being spilled out. Look, and someone that is beaten, look at this hand is elevated. It also has blood in it, right? And then, you know, this with this hand open, boom, a hit very strong in the in the face in the nose so the spilling of blood is also connected with the idea of fertilizing the soil but also in the times of the el niño phenomenon niño phenomenon you know uh, pleasing and, and feeding the gods for them to stop the catastrophes right uh, also let me tell you that in the in in the Andes of Peru there is a ceremony called Chaco where people fight until these days like in the old ways uh, they fight like feast to feast you know and they beat each other's right um, and they you know bleed you know in the floor they bleed you know and then you know after that they are friends Right. And why they do that? They say they do that because the blood fertilizes the soil. And this happens nowadays in Peru. Um, I think we can just give a quick look to this video. I made a selection of some videos to give you an idea of the, um, the findings, the, the places where this um sacrifices happen right the place where the moche people live is really a, a, a beautiful site but as you know it rains almost nothing so the water is fundamental for existence nowadays in peru people continue with their practices People continue kneading on Mother Earth, on Pachamama, on the sun, on the moon. Even though they are Catholic, they still believe in the ancient gods. That's why ceremonies like this one, the Chaku, continues existing. Look at what they do. They are fighting, you know, like fixing their problems there. If you had, you know, a problem with your neighbor, you know, you can hold it inside until the day of the fight. The fight day. And then, you know, you fight with that person and everything is left there. 
the idea is that you will spill some blood. But then after, everybody's friends. This is probably one of the, <laughs> yes, carry. They start fight. <laughs> women with women, men with men. Eh? What they do is continuing a tradition from the pre-Hispanic times. And now at the end, everybody hugs, everybody good friends. Fist fight. Huh? Look at that. You know, so a day of rage. Huh? <laughs> But um, it is all connected with the idea of fertility. So we're going back to um, our slideshow. Mm -hmm. How are you enjoying this event, amigos? Are you enjoying it? Oh, we, are, we are also coming to the last part of this event, which I promise we are going to do another one to continue. Uh, the idea is to be able to understand human sacrifice in a more profound way, no? not just, you know, thinking it in, in a superficial way, you know, or not judging it with the eyes of modern people as we are. Huh? Um, I will be done. <laughs> so, Luis commenting previous edition. Uh huh. Yes, Louis, excellent. Yes, actually, I have a, a, a part of the next event that, that is going to come. It's about sacrifice of the princesses of the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think it's going to come really nicely connected no, with that. Audrey, thanks for your tip support, Amiga, and, and thank you so much to, to the people that are considering supporting this event and, and my channel with a tip. You know that the tips help not just me, help Hago. These are free events, are uh, only pay with your tip support and your, you know, your your um, your tips, you know, are really fundamental for us. And also, if you would like to help me continue creating more events, please consider in becoming my sponsor with one monthly fee, you can help me to create events, uh, and, and new events, as always I do, more lectures and, and so on. No? So, muchas gracias. So, oh yes, Audrey, well, I love history. I love archaeology. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I am a tour guide, but I wanted to be an archaeologist. <laughs> gracias, Cari. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. So, we're going to finish this event with this interesting story. Uh, related with human sacrifice, also in the same region. For now, we are talking about the north of Peru. Um, and we are going to talk about a culture that existed after the Moche. Uh, actually, almost in the same location. They expanded even more, but they are parallel in time to the Incas. The name of this culture is the Chimu, Chimu culture. And they are now famous around the world, not just because they were the most wonderful uh, goldsmiths that we had in our history, not because they made the most amazing architecture, which what they did, they made amazing gold pieces. Uh, of course, they had a, an interesting culture indeed, but they are now famous because they produced the most massive children's sacrifice in the world. And how we know this? Because of recent investigation uh, that happened in a, in a part of the country, now, once again, the north of Peru, uh, in a place called Huanchaquito. So that is also about 500 kilometers north away from Lima. And... This sacrifice was huge. Exactly, my mem uh, Well, actually, the Chimu are the evolution of the Sipan culture, for example, right? So Sipan, Moche, they are pretty much like the same period, the same time frame. And uh, then we continue later, later, later with the Chimu, right? So they are sort of like the, the evolution, we'll would say, because sometimes we try to divide them in names of cultures. But, you know, we don't know how they even call themselves. 
Uh, eh, we, we don't really understand them so much. Um, we see some differences, of course, but basically we, we know that they are evolutions of, of societies, right? Uh, Mamie, oh, Mamie, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Peruvian pronunciation. <laughs> um, so here we have a recreation of this human sacrifice that I will be presenting to you. Uh, this is another investigation and it's connected with children. Yeah. Um, the archaeologists have been able to date or trace back this hu massive human sacrifice to circa the year 1475. Okay. And you can see here uh, the, num the number of children killed. So we have in total, uh, we had in total investigated in 2019, found it, 239 children in this massive sacrifice. Sacrifice with 200 llamas, right? Uh, but one year ago also, there was a new investigation adding more than 70 new children in the location of the sacrifice. And nowadays that zone where the sacrifice happened is sort of like a shanty town or a former shanty town. So uh, the land is already occupied partially. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're talking about the uh, llamas. Oh, a spirit. Llamas, llamas uh, is an animal from the Andes that has very long neck. I think there's one here in the back over here. Do you know the llamas, the llamas? Well, in Peru, we say llamas. Huh? These were, by the way, very young children and very young llamas. Mm -hmm. um, so meaning that in this, in this case, in this occasion, this is a, a much more ultra realistic um, representation. Mame, thank you so much for your tip support. Muchas gracias, gracias. Um, so... Uh, they had this preference for this more young, like pretty, beautiful creatures uh, that were for them considered to be pure enough for the gods to receive uh, this, um, this sacrifice, but also the message in them because these children, the, the sacrifice uh, or the sacrificial person carries a message. To the, to the gods. Oh. Um, and also, when I was preparing you know, this part of the event, I, I couldn't stop thinking on my own children because I learned that the frame is between or was between five years old until 14 years old. And my children are actually from that rank, no? So imagine being the mother or the father of those children, right? Um, but what we will believe in this moment being something completely brutal, oh, that's always the, the thing that we have to trespass. We have to put in the shoes of the people and understanding why they were doing that. It is believed that, and that's why the, the scene is so dark. We had another Nino phenomena in the coast of Peru. Remember, the coast is a desert coast. So what happens when the coast, the desert coast with the cold, humble current the cold water current that has lots of fish always, you know, is changed by a warm current of water. Well, the fish goes away. So there's no fish. There's no food in the coast. The rain happens and there's no way to produce in the floor, in the zones, you know, that uh, because they're all muddy, right? So people are dying of diseases. There's no food. There's nowhere to go. Oh, Louis, thanks so much for your tip support. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, So it is the belief in that moment that the gods demand lives, human lives. So the children that you can see here, which have been beautifully represented also in, a, in an ultra realistic way, we know that they were selected probably because of their beauty, uh, their origin, but not all of them were of high status. There are some children that were of high status, and we know this because of the burials, right? Um, also, we know that among these 
more than 200 children killed, two women and one man adult were killed. So probably the person who produced the sacrifice also was killed at the end. And all the two women, we don't know why, they were also sacrificed. Also the llamas, as you can see, they were 18 months old llamas. So they were very, very young. So this is the um, the site where the where the children were discovered as uh, uh, the, in the moment when the uh, with the, this context was investigated. And as Carrie is saying, indeed, my friend, um, this must have been a tremendous honor for the family who was, you know, like the family of the children who will be killed for the child. And we know this because in most of the cases, the children that are sacrificed in the, in the hair, the evidences of the hair show that the food they were consuming was better than other people in some cases, for example, better than the, the other children, right? Um, so they were prepared for those sacrifices in some cases. In here, it seems that nobody really was consuming good food. So it was a desperate attempt to change, revert the climatic conditions. That's why this was a massive sacrifice. And also we know from the chronicles of the Spaniards uh, that well, they recorded information from their travels in, in the Inca and Peru. They said that the parents who were not satisfied with the idea that, you know, this was a high honor, you know, they could be even killed. If they if they cry for the losing of the children, because this was supposed to be, you know, an honor for them. And they believe in the afterlife. So meaning that the afterlife, which is forever, you know, it, it would make these children to be gods. So you will be a god. You will return, you know, to Mother Earth, but you will turn into a more elevated creature. Right. Um, so to give you an idea also how close the side was with the houses of the neighbors. So imagine if you were living there. <laughs> no, it's incredible. Ellen, thanks for your tip support. Muchas gracias, amiga. Thank you, thank you. Oh, so imagine living across, right? With all of those children right in front uh, in, in that place. Now, I'm, I'm really surprised, you know, that uh, they were able to find in this section so many children, but most likely, also, this section over here must have lots of other evidences that probably were not investigated properly because we have houses on top. Also, the water of the sea still is here in the back. So uh, the place is arid naturally because we are in a desert. But in the picture before here, you can see that there's so much water that in the, arche in the archaeological context, there was discovered a layer of mud on top of the bodies of the children. So you needed to have an amazing amount of rain to be able, you know, in a desert, to be able to be covered with many centimeters of mud, right, there in that zone. Also, look at the desperation also of these people, how they were sacrificed with a cut in the sternum, right, in the, in the chest. There is an artery, an artery that, and of course, keep in mind that they were children also, meaning that, you know, if the cut was, you know, fast, you know, um, the the amount of blood, remember, we are going back to the blood, blood, not, not necessarily hearts, but blood, right? The blood uh, will be spilled, right? And you could also have access to the blood if, uh, to the heart, sorry, if needed. But because of the state of the burial, probably it was exposed for time. We were not able to find any mummies. We just have bones. So we don't know if the organs were moved, if the heart was removed. Um, so blood was, to be honest, more important to be recollected in these scenes, in these ceremonies uh, than other, uh, let's say, other parts. Uh, the heads also are important. In some cases, the heads have been removed. And because, you know, for the, for the pre-Incan societies, for the pre-Hispanic societies, uh, the head was very important because you cannot live, of course, without a head. You can live without a limb. You can live without an arm or a leg, but not without a head. 
So for them, the head was considered to be very important, right? And also offer in sacrifices. Oh, um, so we have here, for example, the cases of some of, of the cases of even facial painting. You know, this is cinnabar. Uh, it's a type of dye or pigment that um, was used for ceremonial purposes. Um, this is also another picture of the burial site and the children also. And in some cases, few of the cases also of the children buried here, uh, we have evidence of skull elongation. Uh, the deformation of skulls, which was just made on the people of the elite, of the elite. Uh, and you can uh, deform the skull of someone only in the early infancy, when they are babies. So in the first year of life. Uh, you cannot start after the first year of life because the skull is already, you know, like hardened, right? Uh, it's, it's hard. But when you are a baby, your mom can deform the skull even sometimes, you know, like accidentally when you are asleep only on one side of your skull or, or your, your head. So it can flatten on one side. So here you can see, for example, you know, the x-rays done to, to this child and uh, also the, the shape elongated, which meaning that mean, meant that this person was of a very important social group. So not just the common ears, the children of the commons uh, were solicited to be sacrificed. Also the children of the people of the high rank were sacrificed, right? Like for example, this child over here with this very pretty uh, headdress uh, uh, and you can see also the headdress over here very pretty, with feathers. This is the note in also high rank. Mm. And also the facial painting once again in the in the face of this person. I see a couple of questions. Louis, please confirm the Incas mummy finder disease in ceramic jar. Well, Louis, uh, that depends on the status of the person who died. Uh, most of the times the mummification in the pre-Hispanic era was natural mummification and not artificial. Because uh, sometimes with the use of cinnabar, uh, which is this, this um, element you see over here, in combination of the climatic conditions where the bodies were, you know, like left in. Um, but not like in the case of the Egyptians where they, you know, like produce an artificial mummification. Most of our mummification was natural, uh, but unfortunately the Incas, the, the kings, where um, their mummies are gone. We don't have those mummies. During the times of the conquest, most of the mummies were burned. Uh, by the conquistadors, or were put to be hiding, and we don't know really how they look like. I uh, hear that was done. Yes, Carrie. Mm -hmm. So finally, a couple of more pictures. And next time, we are going to continue with mummies from the mountains. Mummies from the mountains, and I have a couple of excellent examples of the uh, mummies of young women in the Andes of Peru and also in territories that are not anymore Peru. Uh, uh, one of those cases is in Argentina, in Salta, but a territory that used to be part of the Incan Empire. Uh, so I will be putting very soon again this event on. So uh, please, please, please follow me, follow my channel for the next part, because as you can see, this is a, a an event uh, that will take us, you know, long to, to go in detail. Let me turn on the light and then turn the camera in my direction. So uh, I really hope you enjoyed this um, this this tour, this lecture, uh, as I said before, this is really a, an amazing topic. Huh? We can be talking hours and hours and hours about human sacrifice. Um, well, and next time we're going to be putting on this event, I, I'll tell you with anticipation also, we're going to talk about 
actually natural mummification and you know more in detail evidences of how human sacrifices were done during the Inca times. So um, thanks a lot for coming, amigos, amigas. If you would like to support this guide and this channel and also Hago, uh, please consider in, uh, in helping me with a tip. Uh, I will also highlight the tip button. Um, well, these are free events and just supported with your donations, with your tip support. And also when you donate to a guide, you're also donating to Hago because we split the tips. We help Hago. Also, we guys help Hago to continue being a free platform. You can also help me to create more events if you wish, uh, becoming my sponsor. With one $10, um, let's say subscription, you can help me to create events uh, like every month. And in exchange of your support, I am giving uh, away as a present to my sponsors two monthly classes of Spanish. So if you are my sponsor, you are, you are able to access to my Zoom private classes of Spanish. So you can practice Spanish uh, with a native that speaks Spanish all her life. <laughs> so um, these are classes that are done on Fridays, uh, two Fridays of the month. Uh, and complementary classes to my series that I do here on Hago for free and open to everybody of uh, Spanish for Traveling with Vanessa. So, um, well, that's a, a little way to, to say to you, my sponsor, thank you, because I know a compromise is something completely different. And many people are a little bit afraid of compromising that level, but it really helps me a lot to continue creating events like this one. So, muchas gracias, Ivonne, for, oh, gracias, Ivonne, for your tip support. Gracias, Mark. Gracias, Sam. Oh, Corinne, Natasha, thank you so much. Thanks for your tip support, amigos, amigas. Sayuri, I miss you so much, amiga. Sayuri is our guide in Brazil, in the beautiful Bahia. So, miss you a lot, Sayuri. Thanks so much for coming to Lima today, and I hope you enjoy this uh, tour. When are your next classes for sponsors? Helen, um, my next sponsor class of Spanish is this Friday. Is this Friday, right? And so what I'm doing is one Friday is Hey Go, one Friday is a sponsor. One Friday Hey Go, one Friday is sponsor. So we have here like this. Every week and every Friday, I have one class of Spanish. See? So Thank you so much. Yes, Sayuri, ahí hablamos. Besos. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you for your friendship and for coming to Lima. If you would like to see my published tours uh, on recorded tours on my uh, YouTube, all my information in the description of this uh, channel. See you. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much. <laughs>